series of ICR, which we are conducting as part of the very auspicious uh, reason, and that is to celebrate India's glorious 75 years of independence. Friends, uh, this activity is one of the activities of ICR, as you know, and we have conducted till date 66 lectures, and today is the 67th lecture. Under this lecture series, we had lectures from various as, uh, on various aspects, uh, these, uh, these topics included agricultural research, policy, health, meditation, uh, the uh, motivation, and many other uh, connected issues. Even we had uh, a lecture by C.C. Ravi Sankarji. In the same series, today we have a well-known personality, and uh, you know, is popularly known as Daji we have Kamlesh D. Patelji. So please give a big hand. We uh, welcome you uh, to ICR, sir, and especially to this beautiful campus, National Academy of Agriculture Research Management. Sir, this uh, lecture uh, is, uh, is being attended not only by the audience, which you see here, but a large number of our vice chancellors, 74 universities we have got, it is being live streamed in their auditoriums. It is being attended by the senior level officers of Indian Council of Agriculture Research and many other policymakers from many other departments. So it's a very important platform and we really uh, thank you sir, for accepting our invitation and uh, having agreed to deliver this important lecture. Uh, before I introduce uh, Daji to you, all of you, uh, let me just uh, inform uh, to Daji that uh, this Indian Council of Agriculture Research is one of the biggest network in the world, agricultural research, education, and extension network. It is built on three pillars. So it's not only the research, we also do uh, the extension part. We are directly connected to the farmers through our 730 KBKs. We are directly connected on every aspect of agriculture research, whether it's animal science, it's a fishery science, it's a crop science, whatever, natural resource management. So we have a very well-built network for this agriculture research. And that is the reason why the ICR has been responsible and has contributed a lot in get, getting the food self-sufficiency in all aspects whether it's a milk revolution, white revolution, we say, it's a blue revolution, whether it's a green revolution, a rainbow revolution, whatever you call. So I, so that, that is the strength of this Indian Council of Agriculture Research. So it's our pleasure, sir, to uh, again welcome you to this important, and let me just introduce to you, uh, friends, Daji, also known as uh, Kamlesh D. Patel, is the fourth and current spiritual leader of the global hurtfulness movement. He has spent the past four decades training people across the world in hurtfulness meditation. Daji is the author of the best sellers, and I have read those books, The Hurtfulness Way, which he has written with Joshua Pollock, and Designing Destiny. His work has appeared in the Times of India, Economic Times, Hindustan Times, and Leading TV Networks. These books are available on the Amazon. Daji gives keynote addresses at conferences and conducts workshops around the world. His passion lies in grassroots efforts, especially in taking meditation to the corporates, schools, colleges, universities, and villages of India. Daji is a proud grandfather and enjoys going on nature walks with his grandchildren in Kana Sandivanam, India, where he lives with his family. Uh, friends, this Kana Sandivanam, uh, just half an hour drive from here. Uh, I just request all of you, you can just visit. It is one of the beautiful campus I have ever seen in my life. I was there just before starting of this training program. 1200 acres campus full of greenery and they have converted the entire barren land into a, a land, green land. It's best tissue culture laboratory. You can have the best combination of human with the nature. Everything you can see there, whatever agriculture practices are there. Every kind of wild species, endangered species they have collected. 
and have so beautiful. Kana offers facilities that preserve, protect, and manage this precious resource, the green resource, the wild resource, in a sustainable way. At Kana, nature exists in awe-inspiring stillness and elegance. Kana is a space where humankind and nature coexist in harmony. The intrinsic value of all species of flora and fauna and their right to existence are really worth appreciating. Uh, today, the talk which is going to give is the Krasi becoming Rishi. You know, our government is also giving a lot of emphasis on natural farming, on making a farmer so that we use less and less chemicals. And that is the way how we can go for the traditional farming in addition to what we do. A uh, lot of contribution has been done by Krishi Parasar, you know, our uh, uh, our old uh, Rishi. And uh, there are four, 243 verses in that, which connects directly with the agriculture practices, cultivation, harvesting, how to store the grains, and many, many more things. You must uh, read that book. And similarly, if you see uh, the uh, Braksha Ayurved, that also deals with the disease management, pH, soil, many, many things. So our past has been so rich. We must take advantage of that. And that's what now today we are going to listen from none other than our Daji. So thank you very much, sir. And I request you to kindly uh, deliver your lecture, your thoughts, and please enrich our knowledge. Thank you. Thank you once again. My hearty pronouns to you all and my great appreciation and gratitude to Dr. R.C. Agrawal for inviting Heartfulness Institute to share their experiences, their philosophy. And when I was requested what title to keep for this particular, so only I took two days reflecting over what could be the talk to such an audience. So I said, why not Krishi becoming Rishi? You must have all heard of a great Rishi called Parasar. He was the father of Rishi Vasishtha. And the lineage continued with Vyasa and the rest. Rishi Vasishtha had written a lot of slokas pertaining to agriculture, our relationship with trees, relationship with animals, relationship with microbacterial cultures, etc., etc. And today we are finding how important this collaboration is. Microbes, trees, animals. Anyway, <clears throat> reflecting on my childhood, my father was a Vaidya. At the same time, he was a farmer also from Gujarat. He used to teach me certain slokas. One of the sloka being that every morning you get up, you must fold your hands, look at it, and recite this mantra. Karagre Vaste Lakshmi. You must be familiar with. Karmule Saraswati. Karmadhyetu Govinda. Prabhade Kardarshanam. For many years, I did that during my school days and college days. Why am I supposed to look at my hands? And reciting that there is Lakshmi in my hands, there is Saraswati in my hand, and there is Govinda in my hands. Is it really that case? No. I flatly deny that. But with hands only, we can have Lakshmi, we can have Saraswati, and we can have Govinda. How? Think of three H. One is head, another is hand, and third is heart. You can use your mind, the head, all that you want. But without the hand's cooperation, you cannot execute your mental or mindful disease, I mean decisions. 
Similarly, your <clears throat> reflex action through your hands and cooperation of mind cannot go far without the heart's consent. Because the conscience must agree with my logical mind. Even simple things like what should I be doing research is on? What should I be working on? Which crops should I be growing? What sort of pH will it require? Even before I get into the experiment, I have to remove so many negatives based on the previous experience or the wisdom that I have. Now, often we talk of pollution. I'm jumping from topic to topic and be assured I will connect them all. <clears throat> We often talk of pollution, air pollution, water pollution, soil pollution, or soil erosion especially. Who pollutes the air? Industrialists by and large? For what? There is no other alternative, so they go on in that direction. The main purpose is more and more money. Second thing, water pollution. Many industrialists again, they discharge their sewer into the bore wells. Of course, our country is taking serious decisions, but more and more laws and rules you make, more and more corruption gets in, and underground waters remain polluted. There again, the purpose is more and more money. Erosion of soil, it's ignorance. We don't know how to maintain that. See, when, during one of the intercommunication of my Guruji with Lord Krishna, Lord Krishna used to tell him that, look, during my times, cows used to yield more milk. The crops were more and more in abundance. Soil was fertile. Today is not the case. <clears throat> I kept pondering over all these things. See, the pollution and this erosion. Is there a solution to it? Two first problems are out of greed at a financial level. Third is coming, emerging out of ignorance that I'm not able to maintain the soil quality. I don't know what else to do. I'm so ignorant about it. The greed element, the earlier one, what is the reason behind this greed? We found the reason behind the pollution that is a greed of an industrialist. But what is the reason behind this greed? Again, the ignorance is not fully aware of his or her duties towards nature. Now I bring back again Lord Krishna's statement to Arjun. <clears throat> He said to him after he reveals his Vishwarup Darshan to Arjun, he tells him when Arjun asks a fundamental question that you have shown me your Vishwarup. I'm so fortunate. And I'm grateful to you. You're my best friend. But how can others who are not so close to you can attain and have your Darshan? He said very simply, look myself in your heart, meditate on the presence of the divinity in your heart. When every one of us being educated from early childhood, inculcated with some sanskars, look within, because within is our antaryamin, one who dwells within. And what do we do ultimately? Do we follow this principle? These two fundamental principles I have shared with you. Lord says, experience myself in your heart. And when we say antaryamin, and we continue looking for that entity outside. So how are you ever going to attain the ultimate wisdom? That's number one. Number two part of it. When we talk of pollution and we have concluded that it is the ignorance of an individual, 
how to dispel this ignorance unless and until I am so awakened from within, I am so alert from within, where my conscience is so sharpened. And how can that happen? Again, the answer we find in Gita and in my little life that I have been observing through meditation. I have not studied the way you guys have professionally studied agriculture, especially into its many faces, crops, animals, uh, poultry, agroforestry, genetic uh, research, so many things. In every field, be it research, education, cooking, we have found that it is through meditation only that I can calm my heart make my mind as blank as possible and wait for greater wisdom to prevail from within. Again quoting Gita, <coughs> chapter 2, Sloka 65. Lord Krishna says very simply that everyone craves for happiness. There is not even one single jiva in the universe who is not looking for for happiness. Now, when we ask this question, when we ask this fundamental question, how to enjoy happiness when I am so disturbed? I have everything in my life, yet it doesn't make me happy. So, disturbance has to be removed. And what is the opposite of disturbance? Harmony within, integrated state within myself. And how are you going to arrive at such a harmonious state unless and until one becomes contemplative? And how can you become contemplative unless and until you have a focused mind and focused mind is direct result of exercising your mind. And this exercising of mind, keeping it on one ideal, is a product of meditation. So now you can connect the dots between happiness and meditation. Many scientists, for example, the greatest of all so far we have heard, Einstein. Right? I'm not referring to our Indian sages. They were saintly. At the same time, they were scientists. They did all kinds of researches. They didn't have any Apollos or rockets to go on other planets. They didn't have the astronomical telescopes. But they could close their eyes and see what was the environment, for example, on Moon or on Venus. They have the descriptions. Now science is verifying it. How to see beyond. When we meditate, all these things slowly and slowly unreveals itself. We become more cognizant of what can happen in far distances or what can happen within myself also if I make certain decisions. Now, going back to this idea of Rishi Vashistha, who had written all those uh, slokas mentioning the beautiful aspects of Krishi's life. When we hear this word Krishi and Krishna, the root is the same. Krishna means one who attracts you whose attraction is so powerful that you cannot escape that. Krishi, it's similar to that. Where naturally you are attracted towards, even a small child, for example, you take them and mask them to plant a seed. And after a few days when this child sees that unfolding, you know, the germination of the seed, and slowly, little by little, little by growing and growing, you 
flowers and fruits. You can see the excitement on them. See. Of course, it's a different story. As we grow up, we create different interests. But natural inclination for all human beings is to see creativity unfolding right in front of their eyes. No other profession, I would say, demands so much of saranagati or surrender state to God. You have to have absolute faith in moving forward. Of course, your hands are working, your heart is working, your head is working. Yet, there is another principle that comes into the picture. Today's farmer, or even the ancient farmers, they had to absolutely depend on, first of all, rain God. I'm sorry, I get very distracted by phones, so please forgive me. Eh? <laughs> Einstein, for example, most of his hypothesis and later on theorizing, Hypotheses were born while he was in his bathroom. He would sit in his tub and spend hours together. And during those calm and quiet moments, he would write down some notes. We have also studied, perhaps in chemistry, Kekulé's benzene structure. How many of you know how Kekulé came at this fundamental solution that it is a hexagonal ring. He had a dream. Thank you, sir. He saw a dream where the tail of one snake was in the mouth of another snake and it formed a six ring pattern, say, six carbons forming a hexagonal ring. And this was revealed to him in dream. When we talk of Ramanuja, great mathematician, and he, was recorded saying that some goddess appears to him while calculating something. And I don't know how I'm coming to those answers. She tells me what to answer. And this happens to this happened to him all the time, moment he closed his eyes and thought of the goddess finding the solution. In my life also. As I was mentioning, I'm not so educated, but many things that I have come across in my meditation, especially regarding the water conservation sir, and water management. We all know that RO filters are used in purifying water. And what is it that RO filter contains, which, which becomes so extraordinary? Charcoal, right? Charcoal absorbs, it has the capacity to absorb. Good, bad, everything it absorbs. I'm a pharmacist. I was wondering when we used to dispense charcoal capsules for two reasons. One was for acid reflux. When there's so much of acidity, we used to give charcoal capsules. Another instance when we used to give lots of charcoal capsules, maybe 10, 15 charcoal capsules, say drink it all in one go, was when somebody tries to commit suicide and some sort of alkaloids or strychnine is consumed, you take so much of it. And later on, my father being an Ayurveda, he told me that, you know, when you go to some villages and you don't find medicine when you have diarrhea, burn the toast or burn the chapati and eat it it will become charcoal. Now, what is the property of charcoal? Again, as I mentioned, it absorbs things. It is said, it has to be confirmed, but I read it somewhere, but you guys can confirm it. 10 grams of charcoal from vegetable source is equivalent to, if it's surface area, is so intricate, cellular and tissue culture, I mean, tissue structure is such, that merely 10 grams of charcoal is equivalent to one acre of land. So if we can saturate this charcoal with some fertilizer, either organic or whatever is available, depends on your fancy. 
but both experiments can be done. And I have seen while experimenting, sir, in our Tanha Ashram, that one patch of Mung Dal, one patch of Tor Dal, with and without charcoal that were saturated with cow urine and cow dung, and one with one without, doubles up or triples up the yield of the crop that was exposed to the charcoal. The condition is that it must be saturated first before you throw the charcoal. Otherwise, char that very charcoal will destroy the crop because it absorbs away all that is available. It diverts it to self and it's not available to plants. So this is one funda I have found. Second funda, that in my <laughs> first year of moving to Kanha near Mehabub Nagar, Absolutely barren land, hardly 40 to 50 uh, neem trees were there and pongam trees were there. The water was 1,000 plus feet below the ground. First monsoon, we studied the water flow, how water was moving in the, in the property. Once we understood the flow of water, we created, we deepened the flow. And every 100 feet, we created pits. And in these pits, we put about a foot height of charcoal and on top put the rocks so that it, it, won't, uh, be, it won't be washed away with water's flow. So as water flows, it gets into the first pit. Water goes into, saturates this water and underground water will only, it's a pure water that is going. See? Once it is filled up, the overflow will go to the second pit, third pit, fourth pit, and it goes on until it finds its way into the pond. Similar thing we did wherever we had uh, bore wells. So around the bore well, we dug almost I would say width of 15 feet diameter and almost 10 to 12 feet of depth. And again, same thing, charcoal, we filled it up with charcoal. Water quality really, really improved so well that now we get water at 50 feet or 100 feet level, see. And the greenery that you see is amazing. It's, it's mind blowing actually. Rain. Uh, rainforest species or something that would grow uh, in Western Ghats or in the Northeast. You can you won't expect that to happen in Telangana. But you can see all those trees blooming and well surviving, not just well surviving, thriving uh, in Kana. In four to five years, it has come about and it is worth seeing. And I give the country, I mean, my the credits to the charcoal uses. Soil quality can be enriched with charcoal. Water quality can be improved. Now, when we, I, when I was reflecting in my meditation, of what is the solution? Lord Krishna just doesn't talk like that. It's a mundane thing. He's talking of cow giving milk. And he's talking of erosion time and my days were full of crop. I mean, crops were so great. You guys don't have such a crop. In, in one of my meditation, I was taken back to my childhood. We had some farms. And I had the memory of that farm. When I visited those farms sometime in 1982 after coming from U.S., I saw that the, the periphery of my farms and some parts in the middle, they had shrunken. They had gone down by almost a foot. And you know how much time the earth crust takes in forming just one inch of fertile soil on top. In just a few years, I noticed more than a foot of soil was gone. And where would ultimately go? through the water flow, to the small canals, to bigger canals, to rivers, and ultimately to the sea. The sea beds are so rich with the 
such fertile soil. Even the water content is so high with minerals and other nutrients. That's why a lot of industrialists now, they're manufacturing kelp, for example, or algae cultivation is going on in big way. China is 54% in cultivating green algae, brown algae as well. And they use it for not only for agriculture, you put it back into agriculture farms, but also for food. In South Korea, they use this for making burgers. They make potato chips type of chips also. They consume it with little salt and olive oil. See? So now, coming back to this idea of Krishi becoming Rishi, how in the world are they going to become one? We have to encourage them all. See? That unless and until your mind is calm and quiet, your heart is very clear. You cannot make efficient decisions in life. That's why, again, Gita says, it is through yoga that all your activities can become kausalam. Yoga, karmasu, kausalam. See? So it has to be adopted. Yoga is not the Ramdev Baba yoga I'm talking. It is not about twisting your legs and arms. Yoga means truly how your consciousness is in tune with the higher consciousness. And that can happen only when you meditate. Without meditation, humanity can not be dreamt of achieving the higher states of consciousness. When you think of consciousness again, you read Arth Astavakra Gita. That was the time of Lord Rama and Mother Sita, right? Raja Janak discussing all these matters with Astavakra. It was Lord Rama's time. When Lord Rama was venturing into forest with his brother and his wife, Sita, what were they discussing? Again, consciousness, which the gurus have taught. That was the only way of entertainment. And from these discussions came Lakshman Gita. You must read that again. Third one, Vashishta, Rishi Vashishta. Hits and Hitas are all about such matters related to day-to-day -day life, day-to-day -day existence, and on consciousness. Consciousness is a day-to-day -day affair. It was the fashion. You can see it was the fashion to talk, to discuss on consciousness. It was everything according to them. When a person with calm mind goes to a farm, the crop cannot but remain unaffected because of who is walking in the farm. People often ask me, how are these trees growing faster than anywhere else? Even in their own place, rainforest in rainforests, they don't grow faster as they should but they grow so well in Kanha. It's just in your eyes to see it. See? Because why? Every time we make our children, school children or adults or visitors who plant them, we sit with the plant. We meditate for just for two minutes and pray to God to look after this plant. It works wonders. It creates vibrations. We are talking of vibrations. And next, next fill or the upcoming field of research is going to be only on vibrations. Give you a small example, I will divert from my main topic. That when you fall sick, what happens to your energy level? It becomes grosser, dense. Your frequency re reduces tremendously. And based on the organ, for example, if lungs normal frequency is 7.23, it will come down. If the frequency of the liver is something else, 7.16, it will change. And scientists have found out that how each healthy organ has a particular frequency, normal frequency, and how we can change it and manipulate it through machines. Bacterial infection or be it viral infection, how when it is localized, 
Some virus, some bacteria will be localized in your throat, some in your nose, some in your ear, some in your what? And they affect a particular organ and how it is affected. If you can change the vibratory pattern, it means a lot. To make you understand this aspect of how these vibratory patterns are created by our thinking. <coughs> There was a scientific experiment done in Brooklyn. It explained how the importance of epigenetics means effect of environment on genetic expression. Right. They conducted the study on two groups of individuals. One group was where mothers-to-be, pregnant mother, women, who lived in ghettos, violent atmosphere outside as well as inside homes where well, you cannot predict when your husband or your partner would come home. They sleep with guns under their pillow. So that house, that sort of house environment. And second group of groups of individuals were from a suburban neighborhood, rich neighborhood where there was greater level of harmony. They studied all this. Now, wherever there is violence, for example, if someone tries to punch you, what do you do at that time? You will have immediately sympathomimetic response. Either your hands will go up if you are strong and you fight back. Or if you don't have the ability to fight back, you will run. You will run away from the situation. Or like kangaroo, try to hide them, you know, the head into the sand. Either you fight or take a flight or you hide. This is sympathomimetic response. It means the blood circulation is more towards your limbs. It has moved away from your visceral organs, lungs, spleen, liver, stomach, kidneys, your frontal cortex, and it is diverted to your occipital brain, limbs, so that you can protect yourself. It's a protective mechanism. Now what happens to the mother who is exposed to such environment? She's always under sympathomimetic response, right? Violent atmosphere. So what happens to the embryo growing within the placenta barrier will be crossed by this blood and blood carries this neurotransmitters related to sympathomimetic response. And baby's limbs also will receive more blood though the baby is not fighting. Yet neurotransmitter will cause the blood to move into the baby's limbs more at the cost of growing visceral organs. So their visceral organs, their digestive capacity will be compromised. Lung capacity will be compromised. Their immunity will be compromised. And since lesser blood flows in the frontal cortex, their thinking con cognitive abilities also will be compromised. So you see how outer atmosphere, environmental impact, is on genetic expression. Someone was giving me the example of, I think Sir was, when we were discussing all this thing, then how cows, if you feed them well with love, they give good amount of milk and quality of milk will also be good. Some people bit the hell out of these buffaloes or cows and say, why are you not milking? How can it and how could, what sort of war, milk quality will be, see, vibrations. Imagine also you go home and your wife goes on cursing you or keep on speaking all the bad things that had happened. Would you love to enjoy that food? You would say, why don't you keep quiet? I just came home after such a long time. Let me eat in peace. Everything has impact. It either raises the blood pressure or makes you happy. 
creating environment is in our hands how we conduct ourselves and our being our own calmness our own level of thinking our own level of feelings it creates a certain level of magnetic field within us and it radiates wherever we go we don't have to fabricate you have become that environment all your h's hand heads and heart they are in complete synchronicity and that is yogi and i pray that we all really really become true yogis in our lives and lead a happy blissful life there is no choice or there is no reason why we should lead a stressful life when we already have a solution given by our ancestors don't look for divinity outside moment you look for outside your soul will be disturbed moment you go inward it will be happy and grant you peace that's all i have to share with you and thank you if you all like to meditate we can meditate for a few minutes okay the process is very simple and one time meditation is not going to change anything but it will give you just a taste of it after that if you like it you are most welcome to kanha or we can send someone here to teach you how to meditate and those who are listening from other cities or other countries we have an app called heart chap h e a r t s a w p and we teach this via heart chap as well unlike many yogis this particular system heartfulness doesn't have a price tag on it so that for this kriya you pay so much for this kriya you pay so much to sit near a guru you pay so much none of that and all are freely welcome to this okay meditation is simple as i said we have to focus our attention should be towards the heart and we welcome divinity without any conditions meaning i should not imagine that krishna is like this or prophet is like this or jesus christ is like this or shiva is like this because these are all imaginations of artists you know i ask one of my friends when you think of krishna and you close your eyes whom do you see he say i see bardwaj nitish bardwaj you see I say, is that Krishna? No. So we have to pray to God that I don't even know you are there or not, but I like to believe you are there. And if you are, please grant me some level of peace, some level of stress-free life. Some let me have the inkling of your presence in my heart. So with that, we begin in a neutral bhava or neutral attitude. without imposing any form just imagine that it's present in my heart and hold on to this idea if other thoughts do come let them come don't fight just remind yourself that i am meditating okay. so please gently close your eyes okay. all of you will meditate for about 15 20 minutes and when it's over i'll say that's all okay. please start meditation
Sure. For those who have grandchildren or those who are going to have children later, I do highly recommend that you should grow at least 10 to 20 sandalwood in your backyard. And when your children or grandchildren turns to 15 or 17 college time, those 20 trees at the rate of 5 lakhs, if you make it, you'll get 10 crores. And if you double it up, you can have additional 10 crores for their weddings. So please think of it. Consider planting either red sanders or white sandal wood. Even better, if you can get the seeds of African black wood. This is the costliest wood that is available today. Rather not available because more or less it's extinct. There's, there are many poachers that destroy because of its high cost. 8,000 sterling pounds per kilo. It's almost 8 lakhs rupees a kilo, which is much more than chandan or red sandha. So those of you who have connections or know how to reproduce African black seed, I'll be really, really interested in getting those seeds or saplings. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can entertain them now. Hmm? So. Students. So thank you very much, Chinpa. Really, it's a very good uh, and motivating, uh, inspiring. Uh, I am Sanjay Kumar, director of one of the ICR Institute, Indian Institute of Seed Science, located Namaskar. at Mount. Namaskar, sir. Oh, my question is, uh, in fact, uh, when we are starting this meditation and doing this meditation, how to sustain it? Because uh, when we prolong it for some time, it changes into the sleeping mode. I think this is a question asked by so many in such assemblies. My standard answer has been this. Sit in a chair and tell me if you fell asleep in 10 minutes. People find it difficult to sleep even in a bed. So this is the effect of meditation. It calms you down so much and brings about that different level of consciousness. Our yogis call it as yoga nindra, but it is not nindra. You are fully aware at that time. If you noticed, you will be aware of everything that's going around. At the same time, if you are hooked up with EEG on your head, they, it will appear that you are asleep, but you are fully aware. The delta wave, from EEG will appear whenever you are in such a state of samadhi. Otherwise, it remains restless, like some individuals who are students and who cannot appreciate the value of meditation. And they ignore it so badly. They close their eyes just to show up the professor that I'm meditating, but they are not meditating. Their mind is somewhere else. So you can take a horse to the pond but you can't make them drink. One can transmit divinity 
unless and until your heart is open and welcoming such divinity, only then changes are possible, say. Students, uh, Sri Ramakrishna Paramahansa said that I have I have a suggestion, you know, or an observation. <laughs> there are two types of individuals. One who has a really, really a question in the heart. Okay, I would like to ask. See? Second one, one who knows everything. And if you ask them, they have no answer. So wake up, guys, wake up. Hello, sir. Myself, Yashaswini, pursuing PhD in entomology. Sir, I would like to, I uh, mean, in the recent years, we are seeing many farmers committing suicides and many of them undergoing severe depressions and some might be experiencing a few anger issues. And I would like to ask that, how can we balance such kind of emotions? And is there any initiative from your side yes. so that we can... <clears throat> To me, meditation is like a vaccination. It prevents you from having many mental stresses and anxieties leading to depression and schizophrenia. It prevents it in the very first place before it can attack you. Once depression and anxiety had started, it is very difficult to reverse the trend. Because later on, if you bring in meditation, once you have become depressed, and when you are asked to meditate, what will you be meditating on? Your depressed and negative mind, that's all. So best is to avoid as best as possible. Start it earliest in your life. Don't wait too long. See, often, <clears throat> People say that I will meditate after my retirement. You can't even sit properly. How are you going to sit straight and meditate? You can't. So earlier is better. There are many other reasons. I, if, if you allow me another few minutes, of, uh, which is not your questions, but... What is the use of old man meditating? He is not able to genetically transfer that knowledge or the state of vibrations, all those qualities that he has acquired, unless you are in Middle East. See, where even at 78, you get married and you have multiple wives, in India especially. Well, Marriage is much lower. There is no random freedom here. And sooner you get married, and sooner you have children, better it is for the family. Because at later date, let's say after 30 plus, you get married and have children at 32, 33. And when your teenage children will be there, when you are almost menopausing, your hormones are going through the roof. Your children's hormones are going through the roof. And the whole house will be rocking. There will be so much of stress. Be careful with this one, see. Third thing that I would like to say is that, you know, Amazon forests, where there are a lot of elderly who are slowly and slowly not able to transfer their knowledge that they have attained through their ancestors. They're not able to transfer that knowledge to the younger ones. Why? Because the younger ones are choosing to go out of forests into the cities. So this knowledge transfer is not happening. Now, when you get married, etc., etc., and you have to transfer this knowledge as grandparents to your grandchildren, how old you will old would you be if you're 
first child was at 32, 33, how old would you be when your grandchild comes? And how old that child should be to make them understand your knowledge? Would you be there available for such a knowledge transfer? And parents, they don't have time to even look at you. So my advice, my request to all the youngsters, settle down sooner. Plants also, you have seen how mismanaging the plant growth is affected by the seeds which are so old. Old seeds don't germinate easily. No, you have seen it. Then you have to have artificial insemination. Quality of your genetic expression will be suffering so much. Why do you want to transfer the weakest of your genes to your, your dearest one? Even in getting a thoroughbred horse, you select the right person, right? Right horse. Why not for this also? Right age, right person. After 25, take it for granted. Your potency is going down. Any in, else, any question now? Like, okay. All right. Thank you all for attending, and my thanks to sir. Sir, okay. Good morning, sir. I'm Vinod. I'm first year student of PhD. My question is related to spirituality and divinity. Often this like uh, spirituality is being associated or being linked with the God. So like what, how it differs from divinity and spirituality? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. God, you may call it or divinity, you call it or Allah, you call it, Khuda, you call it. They're all same. But there is a big difference between religion and spirituality. Huge difference. Okay. Thank you, sir. And thank you, Dr. Thank you, sir. May I request now, uh, Dr. Srinivas Rao, uh, to just thank uh, our uh, beloved uh, Daji and to facilitate him with this shawl and memento. Dr. Nirjay Prabhakar, uh, she is the Vice Chancellor of Kondal Lakshman Hotel. She also wants to just thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nijan. Uh, now I request uh, Dr. Srinivas Rao, the director of this uh, institute, to kindly uh, say a few uh, words of thanks. Thank you very much, uh, sir, uh, for gracing uh, this academy and enlightening all of us. Uh, uh, with your uh, golden words, uh, Honorable Sri Kamlesh D. Patelji, uh, Dajiji, President of Sri Ramchandra Mission, and Artful Meditation. And uh, today we are very happy with your graceful presence here. And uh, all of us have benefited, uh, but with your uh, words, and many youngsters are here, certainly. I think these uh, words will be taken uh, to them and uh, in really in, uh, implemented in real sense. And uh, one of all youngsters must be really seeing that a pharmacist uh, becoming a meditation guru here. And by telling about uh, the role of carbon in water purification, soil conservation, and soil erosion, one side, how environment can control and really make in typical drylands, rainforest can be created and also gene expression can be modified. 
So these are the things. What is environment? Perhaps this is the environment, meditation, and these things. How be happy, and uh, how you are uh, uh, exercising your mind with the heartfulness. These are the key messages given by Daji Ji. Thank you very much, Daji Ji, for uh, on behalf of all our uh, uh, colleagues and dear students and uh, all our uh, directors of uh, National Academy uh, uh, staff. And particularly, and uh, we have directors of ICAR, Indian Council of Agriculture Research, leading various uh, domains and uh, for the cause of the country, and also staff, dear students, and many vice chancellors, my own uh, uh, joint director uh, for making all the things happen. And particularly, thank Dr. Agarwal and DDG Education uh, bringing this idea and to implement at NAM. And uh, thank you each one of you and also uh, present media. The point, lastly, I will say, the one of the messages the Daji C said, I quote, be courageous, courageous, be loving, be peaceful, and less inviting to desires. Less inviting to desires. That is the artfulness way of life, quote. Daji ji, thank you very much. So thank you, thank you all, and thanks to special thanks to uh, Dr. Srinivas Rao, Dr. Venkati Sollu, and the entire team, and your team, sir, your press and media, who has been collaborating with us for the uh, last three, four days continuously. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you.